Welcome to DIA Today, Democracy in America Today. I'm Matt Parks alongside Dave Corbin. Glad to have you with us as we explore the ideas behind today's headlines. How's your week been, Dave? Great. Good weather. Um, we finished the brisket, referencing last week's uh, show. <laughs> nice. Two months left in the semester, so really, you know, it's kind of—it's it's always a good. Probably my favorite time of the year was mid-March, uh, as a uh, as the academic calendar goes. You're yeah. about three quarters of the way through, so. Yeah, well, we're just over half because this was our spring break week, um, which unfortunately was a week early because you know spring officially starts on Sunday, and apparently the weather was following the calendar because we had about 35 degrees or 40 degrees and cold and rain. And next week's supposed to be 60 every day. So uh, the students, I'm sure, will enjoy being back in the city for that, but not quite as many opportunities as we would have liked this week to get out and, and do some things during our break. But still, you're right, we're on the home stretch and there's cause for optimism. We all resented losing the hour of sleep last weekend, but uh, I do enjoy that extra hour in the evening. Yeah. My only my only complaint with Texas is that St. Patrick's Day is not as big of a deal in San Antonio as it is say, in New York City or Boston. So doesn't doesn't shock me, but uh, some of the cultural adjustments you've got to make, huh? Being introduced to Fiesta instead. There you go. Well, that has its points as well. Now, leading off, we're going to talk about some actually just recently breaking news about an hour before we started recording here on Friday afternoon. Uh, the CDC announced some changes in its guidelines for schools. And so the, the guideline up until this point had been that students needed to be six feet apart and masked. And the consequence of that, as certainly we at the King's College and many other colleges know as well, is that if you have to be six feet apart, you can't have as many people in the room and the rooms aren't big enough to accommodate all your students on those terms. And so even schools that wanted to have students in person and have been laboring to do that have been forced to do kind of a hybrid model where some days you're in person, some days you're at home and, and trying to, to navigate those waters. Now, obviously with, with three feet, much, much easier to space desks appropriately and to allow all the class at the same time. So you can imagine five days a week in-person schooling being one of the results from this, obviously, if, if school districts adopt policies consistent with these, these new guidelines. And a lot of this was really in the works for some time. You know, you go back and look at the research on this. There's been indications that that three feet was, was good enough for some time. But there was a study that just came out recently of Massachusetts, 200 school districts in Massachusetts, that showed that there was no real difference between three feet and six feet when it comes to social distancing at least for the elementary school students. So, you know, this is going to presumably change some of the thinking on all this. And uh, those poor parents and students that have been waiting for six months or a year, in some cases, to get back in school. I think it's good news. I think that especially for those uh, inner city districts that uh, teachers unions keep on arguing that we just don't have enough space to get everyone back here, I think three feet could very well do it. But my guess is that uh, on this uh, report, uh, like every other uh, bit of science or non-science that comes forward, that power rather than truth or the idea that one's being disempowered rather than truth will rule the day. Yeah, that's the interesting thing in all this. Of course, all during the campaign last year, the way that the debate between uh, Biden and Trump was framed on this question was, was science versus anti-science. And now that the Biden administration is in power, we're finding that, well, it's science plus in some of these matters because there's powerful allies on the side of the Democratic Party that aren't eager to follow the science wherever it may lead. Uh, an example of that, New York Times reporter spoke to the president of the American Federation for Teachers, the, one of the two big teachers unions, Randy Weingarten. And here was her reaction to this study. It's a debate about convenience, not a debate about safety. All of a sudden, because we can't squeeze in every single kid, if it's six feet, that miraculously there's now studies that say three feet are fine. And what's going to happen is people are just not going to trust it. Now, I wouldn't be surprised if they don't trust it, if they listen to people like Randy Weingarten, because rather than reading the study, reacting to the study, and it's fair to criticize studies, right? You can go and look at the, the, the way the data was gathered and you can look at the conclusions that were drawn there. There's many responsible ways of doing that. 
but rather than doing that, she just throws a conspiracy here, right? There's all of a sudden, miraculously, this, this study appears just when it's inconvenient for the narrative that she's wanting to push on behalf of her union. Science as a means is problematic when it doesn't fit into your political ends. Yes, and that may not be a problem that we find just on the political right. We have more to say about education as the show unfolds because, Dave, you've got some important chapters for us from Democracy in America that take up education Related themes and and continue to take those reflections on the overall philosophical approach of the American people under democratic institutions. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, I, I think it's important as we go through this material to keep in mind these concepts that make their way into De Tocqueville's discussion of the influence of democracy on the American intellect. Concepts like power and truth and equality are very much, or and inequality for that matter, are very much part of uh, what he suggests will happen to the democratic mind moving forward. So uh, even that um, discussion that we just had uh, plays in nicely what, with, with, with Tocqueville's uh, thoughts on the matter. So just to kind of situate uh, our audience, if you haven't been listening for a couple of weeks or don't know where we are in Tocqueville's uh, great masterpiece, we're now in volume two of Democracy in America. Uh, and that volume is divided into four parts. Uh, the first part takes a look at democracy's influence on our intellect, our mind, our reason. Uh, next week, we'll start part two of volume two, in which we look at democracy's influence upon our sentiments. Uh, thirdly, we'll go on to look at its influence upon our mores or habits of the heart. And then he'll finish volume two by talking about the threat of soft or democratic despotism. So, we're here uh, this week finishing up our discussion of the intellect, and there are really four chapters that I want us uh, to focus on uh, for uh, today, uh, to chapter seven uh, through 10 uh, of part one of volume two. Chapter seven titled, What Makes the Mind of Democratic Peoples Lead Toward Pantheism? Chapter eight, How Equality Suggests to the Americans the Idea of the Indefinite Perfectibility of Man. Chapter nine, how the example of Americans does not prove that a democratic people cannot, can have no aptitude and taste for the sciences, literature, and arts. And then finally, uh, our last discussion for today in Tocqueville will be why the Americans apply themselves to the practice of the sciences rather than to theory. So pantheism, perfectibility, uh, moving toward a discussion of uh, science and theory and an aptitude or non-aptitude uh, for science, literature, and the arts. How do all of these things hold together? Well, let's start with the discussion of why democratic peoples lean toward pantheism. Tilfield writes early on that pantheism has made great progress in our day. And he references how it's been brought into European intellectual history by the Germans uh, in the realm of philosophy and by the French in the realm of literature. And here there's a reference, a note in the Mansfield uh, translation to the influence in particular that the philosopher Hegel has on the European mind. Uh, pantheism in Hegel, um, I think, can be best kind of broken down or reduced, not that anything in Hegel is easy to break down, as you remember, as you and I uh, took um, the two core sequence on Hegel with Stanley Rosen at Boston University. And while you outscored me in the French language, a story to remain for another day, one of us received an A from Stanley Rosen and the other received an A minus. Oh, I didn't even take it for credit. I, I sat in on a few lectures. That's all I could handle. I, uh, could, have, I could have sworn. <laughs> no, I... It, was, it was a one class in graduate school where... No, I scored higher than you. No, that, okay. no, I'm sure there was, but it wasn't that one because I was too chicken to take it. Okay. Rosen did a great job. Uh, Professor Rosen, I should say, did a great job uh, of explaining uh, Professor Rosen's philosophy. But also, I think he, <laughs> one, of, one of his um, you know, amazing talents was to, to take a thinker like Hegel and a book that we were reading, The Science of Logic, and, and to put it in um, terms that uh, lay people like ourselves or 25-year-old graduate students could understand. Basically, what Hegel does with philosophy, philosophy, or does in philosophy, I should say, is he suggests to his readers that this question of what is, that 
what is what is what is this world that we live in that that defines the philosophic enterprise has finally been answered by none other than Haeckel himself uh, that he has come to terms with what is by understanding the mechanism uh, of isness uh, in both the realm of ideas and the realm of the material. Uh, in the realm of ideas, what comes into being is a thesis that is soon thereafter followed by an antithesis that creates a synthesis that is once again antithesized unto forever more. Ideas that come into being are challenged, form syntheses, and then become theses, theses themselves. In the material realm, being comes out of nothing. When that happens, you have becoming, which then goes back into nothing and being and so on. So there's this dialectic working both ideationally and materially. Once you figure out the dialectic, you figure out how isness works uh, in both the realm of the ideal and the material and life is settled thereafter. What's happened here uh, and what makes this thought um, pantheistic is uh, in creating an idea about ideas and matter and subsuming all things within that idea, all things then become understood. It's just a question of how they'll be appropriated or played out or materialized uh, thereafter. So this, this idea of Hegel uh, and others who follow suit, Marx would be a, one of the more famous um, students of Hegel on the left, creates this tendency within the democratic mind uh, to want to simplify thought. And as Tocqueville will write, to enclose God and the universe within a single whole. All things, material and immaterial, visible and invisible, are subsumed into an immense being. Now, what's wrong with that? Is there anything wrong with that? Well, Tocqueville's verdict is that all who remain enamored of the genuine greatness of man should unite and do combat against it, against this theory. Now, Matt, why would individuals who are enamored with the genuine greatness of man, why, would they, why should they unite and do combat against this tendency within democracy. One of the points that Tocqueville makes in terms of the political consequences of pantheism is that it really submerges the individual. So all individuals are kind of brought together into a common whole. And, and of course, not just human beings, right? But, but all of nature. This is where sometimes on the environmentalist left, we see kind of pantheistic vision actualized or, or operationalized, perhaps I should say. And so you end up with the idea that, that individuals could have individual value really having no place in such a system, but we're all just part of this undifferentiated whole. And of course, when you think about how this works in a system like Marx's, when that comes into political reality, it doesn't turn out that it really is just an undifferentiated whole. The, the, the people are maybe an undifferentiated whole, the mass, but there's always those leaders. Right? There's, all, there's always the people at the top of the political pyramid who are exercising the awesome power which a pantheistic system allows them to wield as, as the ones who understand, right? who, have, who have reached the right verdict, right judgment and understanding of the whole. They have the right on that basis to wield power over this undifferentiated mass of people. And of course, the results over the course of the 20th century and now into the 21st century are uncommonly awful as these kinds of ideals are operationalized. So a political movement that promises greater equality produces greater inequality. And here I'd reference back to an episode from season one where we talked about C.S. Lewis's The Abolition of Man. And there's very much this, this thesis that runs through uh, Lewis's work there, it's very much in line with what Tocqueville uh, is suggesting that you, you think that if you make the world more equal, it will create greater liberty and a greater resistance to the powerful. But in reality, if all things are broken down into one or to reduced into one thing that resembles all other things, 
it allows for, enables for a political situation uh, that is uh, that, that produces the greatest amount of artificial um, inequality. So let's move forward then to the next chapter. So uh, pantheism as a tendency uh, within to influence the democratic mind or, or to be for the democratic mind to be captive of pantheism, but also the democratic mind to be captive in a belief in the indefinite perfectibility of man. Tocqueville says that it makes total sense why human beings would think that the better or the more perfected is possible. Quote, although man resembles the animals in several points, one feature is peculiar to him alone. He perfects himself and they do not perfect themselves. The idea of perfectibility is therefore as old as the world. Equality did not give birth to it, but it gives it a new character, end quote. Well, what character? Well, instead of the aristocratic taste for better that requires greatness and the knowledge that we'll never be able to perfect things, the democratic mind mesmerized by change, mesmerized by the possibilities open to perfection, considers all things within human reach. So here I mentioned earlier, these concepts such as power and equality and truth very much play a part in this discussion of education and the American intellect. And what's happening, the stronger your tie or belief is in an indefinite perfectibility of mankind, the more you believe it's in your power right, to make that happen. So the more likely it is that you're going to hand over that power or pay deference to the powerful who will then perfect things for you. Yeah. And the more that you feel the moral imperative to pursue those changes, right? Not only do you have the confidence that it can be done, but, but you feel the burden, if it can be done, then we better do it. And I think here, you know, we're seeing, if we connect the, the, these last two points, we're seeing the significance of a rejection of, of fundamental Christian propositions. And we've already seen how important Christianity is to the preservation of democracy in de Tocqueville's account, because Christianity is strong where democracy is weak. And so what happens when you break down the distinction between the creator and the creature? That's what pantheism does, right? It, it's, it's, all, it's all God. Uh, there's no distinction between creator and creature. And now what happens when you break down the distinction between the holy and the sinful, right? What, what happens when you, you start to believe that all of human problems are outside in problems, which it's, it's environmental circumstances that creates bad behavior in human beings. And so if we change those environmental circumstances, we get good behavior. But what if instead, as the Bible clearly teaches, we have a fundamental inside out problem? It's, it's the depravity of the human heart that has consequences for all of nature, not just in terms of the consequences of the fall that were announced in Genesis 3, but in the way that we interact with each other, in the way that we cause harm. And, and therefore, if you have that account of human nature, all of a sudden you recognize there are, there are some limits to the reforms that are possible. And you're going to tread carefully. And you're going to make sure that as you pursue political improvement, as you work toward justice, you don't do so in ways that, that make things worse ultimately, or that create the possibility of, of power structures and concentrations of power that can be grossly abused. And as we mentioned, drawing from last week's discussion of Francis Bacon, the desire to conquer nature ends in the fulfillment of the second part of his project, the conquest of human nature, uh, or as C.S. Lewis rightly calls the abolition of man. So moving to the last two chapters that I want to cover for today, Tocqueville on multiple occasions has no noted the influence of religion on the first American immigrants. Uh, he likewise has spent a lot of time going through the influence of the pursuit of wealth uh, through industry and commerce on the American mind. So these two things um, uh, come together, he says, in that Americans, quote, demand of science, particular application to the arts and the means of rendering life easy. So the tendency is that the more that we pursue wealth through industry and commerce, the more that science is going to be something that should or pro that should produce rightly a pragmatic end, a consequence. Now we'll still go to church on Sunday 
and we'll still, um, he says, from time to time, uh, we'll still have distracted glances toward heaven, but most of the time, we're going to be working towards our material betterment. We're going to um, we're going to want to use our knowledge to make life easier. And I think what he suggests here is that there are more people out there wanting to practice art, but they're not doing so for the sake of art more than what the art grants them or gives them or produces for them. And this practice of art, not for the sake of art, the practice of science, not for the sake of science, uh, tends to produce um, an, an American world uh, that is more of a world of the pursuit of place hunting rather than the pursuit of wisdom. It's all about having the right people in your Rolodex rather than the right books on your shelf. See, that's, that, there's an easier path, it seems, to influence than the pathway of wisdom in the democratic society that Tocqueville is talking about. Yeah. So I think here it's just, it's clear that he says that a proper aptitude and taste for the sciences, literature, and the arts allows us to be more fully human because we as human beings can pursue those ends. But in a world where those things are just a means to another end, what it reduces us as human beings is simply a means rather than an end to ourselves, an end that needs to be uh, liberated. And you know, I'm always you know, fond of this question often brought up by parents during visit days where I, I tout the benefits of, of what my favorite major at, at Providence, philosophy, politics, and history. And I have parents often tell me, well, what are they going to do with that? What are we going to do with that? What are you going to do with that? And how many students have you heard who, who major in the humanities or go to a liberal arts college, have that uncle or aunt or friend? What are you going to do with that? Well, right. I'm, I'm not learning it to do something with it. I'm, I'm learning it, right, to be a liberated human being in, in the right sense uh, of what it means to be uh, liberated. So this ties in uh, nicely to the final chapter that we're going to cover for today, chapter 10, why the Americans apply themselves to the practice of the sciences rather than to the theory. What might be some difficulty there if it's just practice and, and no theory? Here Tocqueville divides science into three parts. Um, the first part, what he calls theoretical principles that tend to be abstract. Secondly, general truths that tend toward practical demonstration. And then thirdly, uh, those, uh, those items of science that are simply application. Uh, and execution. And he says that the agitation and revolutionary character of democracy making meditation difficult, meditation on theoretical principles difficult, tends then to direct our mind more towards application and execution. And he sums up uh, how this will, how this will uh, feel in life uh, with a great quote. Most men who compose these democratic nations are very eager for present material enjoyments. As they are always discontented with the position they occupy and always free to leave it, they dream only of the means of changing their fortune of increase or of increasing it. For minds so disposed, every new method that leads to wealth by a shorter path, every machine that shortens work, every instrument that diminishes the cost of production, every discovery that facilitates pleasures and augments them seems to be the most magnificent effort of human intelligence. And, you know, I think of this and I think about this great trend in education, especially in elementary education, towards making sure every student has a computer, every student has a screen in front of their face, and every student knows how to figure out how to make their way through this software at the ages of five, seven, nine, and 11. And why? It's easy. It's fun. It's visual. It, it, it plays into all that we want. But are the children in this situation actually learning or are they being entertained? Yeah, I think that's, that's a real challenge that we face. And I think this passage does a good job of really showing us the danger of a democratic society's focus on improvement on, on merely making things easier, right? There, there's not a lot of room here for bending an afternoon with a book because what are you going to get out of that, 
What, what productive benefit follows from that? And how do you speed that process up? Well, you know what you could do? You can listen to our podcast on 1.25 times, right? Or maybe 1.5 times and you can get a little bit of time back, right? That way you can, you can, it all goes by more quickly and maybe harder to process, but that's okay because you're saving time, right? You got, you got 10 more minutes that you can use for, for some other purpose. There's, there's another passage in the same chapter that I think is right on point here because there's another consequence of all this. Why, why is it that we want the shorter, the easier? Well, he says, it's not by long and learned demonstrations that the world is led. So there's a political advantage right, to avoiding the long and learned demonstration and focusing on the immediate. And he goes on to say, in centuries in which almost everyone acts, one is therefore generally brought to attach excessive value to rapid sparks and superficial conceptions of the intellect. And on the contrary, to depreciate immoderately its profound slow work. And I think if there's anything that captures the intellectual scene, excess value to rapid sparks and superficial conceptions of the intellect, right? Those, those are the things that are, that, are, that are hot, that grab the headlines, that get turned into the policies and the profound slow work uh, the, of, of deep reflection on timeless questions, who has the time? Yeah. And I think that this is a particularly apt for those who are Christian parents in our audience. There's a desire among many a Christian looking at a college like Providence and the King's College to say, well, how quickly can my son or daughter get through there? And I'm going to have them earn 60 dual enrollment credits by the time they're 16, so they can go there when they're 17 and graduate when they're 19. And for what? I, I understand, right, that college tuition is out of control. It's the price of, of college is where it should not be where it is. But this like rat race to get through as quickly as possible. And I'll, I'll take my core classes in community college because they're, they're all, all the same anywhere. It's just this kind of part of this mindset that that leads to a, a degree that is more superficial than real, right? A mind that hasn't actually spent the time required to meditate and to go through uh, a difficult problem or idea or question. And, and a mind that hasn't meditated on the difficulty of existence is a mind that's going to be prey to ideology. It's going to be prey to simple, you know, resolutions on the political left or political right um, to questions that have plagued us since we've been here as, as humankind. All right. Well, one of my favorite topics uh, within political philosophy and literature, I actually wrote a dissertation on this, um, is the difference between the moral universe outlined by Niccolo Machiavelli and William Shakespeare. I think Machiavelli uh, probably projected better into the future. Uh, he writes this short, key short uh, volume, <laughs> The Prince, um, Shakespeare's works, uh, are longer. In fact, I can think of, I'm counting correctly or following Harry Jaffa's numerology. There are 37 plays that line up nicely with Plato's 37 dialogues. They take a lot of time to get through. Uh, never mind the language. You've got to work through each of them. And the play of Shakespeare's, that's often known as its um, autobiographical play, is The Tempest uh, that has this central figure of Prospero. And I chose this as our adjacent selection for this week because I think it works in well, this play, and in particular, Shakespeare works in well with this idea of the degree to which human beings can attain the perfect. I compare Shakespeare with Machiavelli. Machiavelli is keen to describe the world in very pantheistic terms as imperfect as a constant war, um, that there really is no such thing as peace. Much of the advice that Machiavelli uh, gives his future princes uh, in The Prince uh, deals with this reality of war. And my take on Shakespeare is that his moral universe in many ways overlaps with Machiavelli because there are all these problems that we deal with uh, as being human beings and, and being imperfect or sinful. But Shakespeare differs from Machiavelli on this one important point, and that is peace, at least for a time, can be attained, but it takes or requires wisdom and power being held in the same hands. This is an issue that comes up in Plato's Republic, of course, and 
however much wisdom and power might intersect, that wisdom and power intersected can produce peace only for a certain amount of time, that we're not going to be able to establish peace in this world. But the best of all of Shakespeare's protagonists create to some degree a peace within each play. So if you're going to go back and read Shakespeare, I think you'll see the challenge of the peace usually stated somewhere in the beginning of the plot. And you'll see whether or not that challenge is met or not met uh, by the various characters that lead events forward. And this is also true uh, in The Tempest. So what has produced the threat to the peace? So here I want to draw your attention to uh, Act 1, Scene 2 of The Tempest. Uh, if you're familiar with The Tempest, The Tempest begins with a tempest. It's a tempest that's created artistically uh, by Prospero, who waves his magic wand, uh, and to uh, the the horror of his daughter, who is watching uh, these men on a ship, uh, wondering what will happen of their lives uh, as they face this tempest. Uh, Prospero tells his daughter, Miranda, do not fear for these individuals who are on this ship. Tell your piteous heart, there's no harm done. Then he goes on to say, I want to tell you, daughter, why we're here. And he relays to his daughter. So here, the theme of today's show is education. So here you have a father educating his daughter who says to Miranda, I have done nothing but in care of thee, O thee, my dear one. Thee, my daughter, who art ignorant of what thou art, not knowing of whence I am, nor that I am more better than Prospero, master of a full poor cell, and thy no greater father. The story that Prospero is going to tell his daughter after he lays down his mantle, lays down his art, is a story of an individual, his own person, who was so caught up in his love of study, that he handed off power to his brother. He writes, the government I cast upon my brother and to my state grew stranger, being transported and wrapped in secret studies. You see, for Prospero, the pursuit of wisdom and the truth had led him away from the desire for power. But the power then granted by Prospero to his brother was abused by his brother. Why? His brother knew, being once perfected, how to grant suits, how to deny them, who to advance, and who to trash for overtopping. New created the creatures that were mine, I say, or changed them. He changed the manners of the people. It's quite interesting here. I won't make too much of this, but there's a little bit of Machiavelli that goes on in Prospero's brother, who he gives power to. He teaches the short path, the path to power, and place hunting of how to gain office, right? how to be in the right position. Prospero, neglecting these worldly ends, was dedicated to bettering his mind. So what happens of all this is Prospero and his daughter set on a ship are led to this island. And I would argue that the peace that is brought about when the wise who rightly pursue wisdom or truth and hand over power or the instruments of the state uh, can produce within society great problems, great challenges. And in many ways, um, what we're talking about here as we move from an aristocratic age uh, where a Prospero-like pursuit of wisdom is more likely to a democratic age uh, where a Machiavellian pursuit of place hunting uh, happens or occurs more likely, produces this danger, produces this world in which um, will there Will there be individuals who have meditated upon truth and rightly pursued wisdom present to influence things, to speak truth to power, or will all things be undone, uh, much like things seem to be undone uh, on this island? Well, the good news is that fortune has brought uh, these individuals uh, to Prosperous Island. And the even better news is that they brought a young man who... Prospero would like to marry his daughter. Uh, and I think what's being suggested here, and I could say more if you want to read the dissertation, just send me an email, is that there is something about the legacy of the pursuit 
of wisdom, uh, biblical wisdom, philosophical wisdom that is more longstanding uh, than simply the desire to acquire power uh, for a certain time, right? To, to, to have that tweet that goes out that really kind of riles the other and it gets 17,000 likes right away. You may win the day, you may win the immediate, but you lose the long term uh, to the detriment of your society. Any thoughts, Matt? It makes me think about the academy because one of the points that Tocqueville makes is that although you might think, well, you know, the academy has no place in a democratic society, this kind of time for reflection and, and such is just out of character with the material pursuits of democratic society. That's true. But democratic societies are prosperous and they're big. And so there is room for some number of people to, to be doing that kind of thing. And as it turns out, in the years after took those writing, you have the emergence of the modern research university, and you've got you know, thousands of people that are pursuing supposedly the life of the mind. But what happens when instead of pursuing actual wisdom, they pursue only pseudo wisdom, which is the actual story of the modern academy? Then, then who's left? Who is actually left to pursue real wisdom? I think this is one of the questions that was kind of coming out of this episode, is that is, there's, there's a room for a Providence, for a King's College, for the classical Christian movement, for the homeschooling movement to actually be this, this remnant of people that are committed to actual wisdom in, in, a, in a world where the, the, the schools with the fancy titles and the really expensive tuitions are not doing that. They, they've, they've given that up. They've given themselves over to pseudo wisdom and they were sort of place hunting and ideology. There's room for, for those of us who, who see something else to, to fill that gap and, and to produce people who come from backgrounds that aren't as privileged or fancy or, or as um, likely according to the standards of the world to succeed, to actually produce students that are well-prepared to think uh, and to think rightly and to think well about the human condition. Yeah, think about three things that define elite American higher educational institutions right now. Beautiful campuses with large endowments, wonderful dining halls and buildings that you live in, pleasurable existences on a quad, mixed with the likelihood that the name of that college on your resume will lead you to acquire the place that you want, perfectly suitable for place hunting. And likewise, when you're there, you won't be challenged with the pursuit of wisdom. You'll be handed a certain, a certain dictionary of how you speak properly about issues, a certain ideology that's ready-made. Made. It's, it's a, a painting-by-numbers ideology of intersectionality, of, of wokeism, that will suit you well when you go into your first interview or when you try to move forward to the next higher place and the next higher place. But what are you at, at that point? You're a means to a system, not an end unto yourself, not that, not that individual who Tocqueville says is so necessary in our age or who Shakespeare wanted uh, or Prospero wanted his daughter to be. That's a great transition to the headlines. We've been talking about the Academy and also high school education, elementary school education, a couple of really interesting articles in the last couple of weeks about the trajectory of things that kind of fit in with the conversation we've already been having. There's a piece in the Atlantic by Caitlin Flanagan entitled, Private Schools Have Become Truly Obscene, about her experience as a teacher at an elite private school and some of the changes in those schools over the last 25 years. And, and the this, this story, it's, it's a long piece, well worth reading all the way through, but it begins with some reflections upon what's happening at, at Dalton, which is one of the leading prep schools in, in New York City. And the key question, if you run Dalton, is what do hedge funders want? And so that includes an archaeologist in residence, uh, a teaching kitchen, a rooftop greenhouse. There's a quote from a member of the local land use committee. Next time, it'll be a heliport. Right? So this is the kind of scale $54,000 a year to go here. The head of school makes $700,000 a year. And there's this 
deep anxiety among the families that she's describing because their school's not open and their kids are falling behind because some of the other elite prep schools in New York city are open. And so what's, what's happening says the Dalton parent is not supposed to be on the wrong side of a savage inequality. She is supposed to care about savage inequalities. She is supposed to murmur sympathetically about savage inequalities while scanning the news, her gentle concern muffled by the jet engine roar of her morning blowout, but she isn't supposed to fall victim to one. So let's go back to these realms, ideational and material as we analyze this. Materially, there is a great amount of inequality. You might even call it savage. So how do you ease your conscience about the savage material inequality that exists that allows you to have helicopters land on your school? You do so by buying into intersectionality as an ideational theory about the world. So you make your conscience feel better by having the latest trend when, when in reality, you live out a life of great inequality. You, li you live it in every aspect of your life. Key is not that you uh, give up on the privileges of your unequal position, but that you adopt the right posture in thinking about those privileges and the right positions and the right values in the way you speak so that you're able to salve your own conscience and also keep up your standing among those that you're connected to. Right. So in most of modern history, there was an antagonism, uh, this is David Brooks, between the bourgeois and the bohemians. So what do you have now? Well, you have the bobo. And I think you have, now have the bobo on steroids. Right? The further that we've gone, you know, Brooks writes his book you know, 25 years ago. I mean, the, the type of thing that you now have to buy into right, as a bourgeois to maintain your bourgeois status is a type of bohemianism unto just utter irrationality but that's just what's expected of you. And if it's expected of you, you're going to expect it of your son or daughter if they are going to move forward and hold your place or have your place once you give it over to them. Yeah, one of the schools that Flanagan mentions is Harvard Westlake, which is in Los Angeles. That sent 45 students to Harvard in the <clears> last <throat> five years. So 600 students in grades seven through 12. Tuition is 42,600 for next year, Dave, in case you're thinking about that. Uh, other fees get you up to about $50,000 a year. Uh, but there was an article in the City Journal by uh, Barry Weiss entitled The Miseducation of America's Elite, which also talks about this school and actually begins with a, a story of, of, of the author meeting with some parents in a backyard very, very carefully. No names anywhere in this article. No names anywhere in this article. Talking about their concerns about the trajectory of the school. And what is that trajectory? Well, there's lessons in anti-capitalism that make them uncomfortable, given the fact that uh, Charles Munger, Warren Buffett's right hand, and Sarah Murdoch, wife of Lakeland and Rupert's daughter-in-law, are on the board. A little bit ironic that this is an anti-capitalist operation. But then more than that, they're concerned about the, the woke ideology that's being adopted, uh, the efforts to make the school anti-racist, uh, which they announced last summer. And, and just the way that this is influencing how their kids talk to each other, how they think about themselves. Uh, and, and fear is really one of the central themes of this article. So obviously the fear of parents, but then there's the fear of the students. And they don't want to talk to each other because they're afraid that when they do that, they're going to talk the wrong way. And if, if the wrong thing gets put in the wrong place, that could ruin their entire future. Right. They're, 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 they're mindful of just how tenuous their status is, uh, the social shaming that can go along with that. There's, there's children that are, whose parents are involved in this article who are begging their parents, don't, don't, don't get involved in the article. Don't, don't say anything, e even if you're anonymous, because who knows what might happen, uh, what, what dangers might befall them. And it's, it's this kind of mix of almost laughable pretension right? Because the, the kinds of success that they're envisioning are so hollow, ultimately. But you really feel badly for these kids because they're, they're legitimately fearful that their lives are in danger of being ruined by, by a parent who's, who's speaking too boldly for the moment. Yeah, the quote that stood out to me in, in this piece uh, was from a STEM teacher at, at one of the New York's prestigious prep schools. And he, he says, 
What does it say about the current state of that meritocracy then that it wants kids fluent in critical race theory and white fragility, even if such knowledge comes at the expense of Shakespeare? And then goes on to say the colleges want children, customers, that are going to be pre-aligned to certain ideologies that originally came out of those colleges. So they don't want to educate. They want those who've already been bought into the ideology because it makes their job easier. He goes on to say, I call it woke weaning. And that's the product schools like mine are offering. That's from someone on the inside, woke weaning. Yeah, it's striking to think about a college that wants students that have already learned what the college is offering. So, so what is the college actually for then, right? Because <laughs> it is place hunting. What, what else could it be for? It's making the connection, setting up in life, enjoying four years of frivolity and, and whatever else, because you, you've already been formed in the way they intend to form you. And now maybe they, they teach you how to weaponize that in more effective ways. But, but what else is there? The, the education side, remember Veritas, right? Harvard, <laughs> long since abandoned. So the piece concludes that this ideology is now increasingly prevalent at public schools. And interesting development just along these lines last night in California, California's ethnic studies model curriculum was approved by the state's board of education for use in K-12 schools. Well, what's involved in this curriculum well, you should read Carmen Hilditch's a number of pieces on this, and there's others that have written about this as well, so you can get a lot of the details. But he focuses in on just one aspect of this, some of the teaching on religion, uh, which includes the, the teaching that white Christian settlers committed theocide against indigenous tribes when they arrived in the New World by murdering Native American gods and replacing them with the Christian god. And then it goes on, beyond just claiming this, to then lead students through what, what can only be described really as, as a prayer to some of these, well, apparently revived, no longer uh, murdered Aztec gods to help them to pursue critical consciousness. There's actual chant and a, and a ritual that you're supposed to go through as a class exercise. Yeah, it's interesting to note, right, that for many of the people pushing this platform, all truth is is consciousness. This is Hegel once again. So that really that, that theocide that how can you really kill a God if it's real? And if it's, if you've killed it, how can you pray to it? Well, you can revive it by, by being conscious of it again. And that's, that's kind of, this is the, the shift, right? This is what, uh, this is what the ideology is suggesting that there really is no God, right? There really is no nature or human nature. Those are just things that we conquer. All things are projections of power. There really is no such thing as education. There's, there's just power. And, and this thing that we call education has been a way for peoples of the past to hold power over other people. And I guess the question that I'd have for our audience is that if you believe that there is no such thing as education, that all everything amounts to is power, then we're right back in Plato's Republic in the argument that Socrates is trying to make against Thrasymachus right? That there is a truth that, that we ought to be pursuing, whereas Thrasymachus says no, right? Justice, as is all things that we define in this world, is simply a matter of the advantage of the stronger. And, that, and that's the crux, I think, of, of the debate that we have. But I, I come out of this mad optimistic and because and, I believe that two plus two equals four. I believe that the mind that knows how to think, knows how to think. Uh, I believe there is such a thing as nature. I think there is such a thing as human potential that can be developed. Uh, that there is a way to do that. And I think that there are, there are examples of that that are happening uh, in education uh, throughout this country that if followed by more and more people would produce, not for the sake of the result, um, you know, a college entrance or this or that, right, but a better lived life. And, and I think that's that what's what we're emphasizing in this conversation. That's what Tocqueville wants. That's what Shakespeare wants. And I think that's what any educator should want in education. That's a great place to end it. I think we could probably do three hours on this if we wanted to, and we may come back to it time and time again, but let's transition to the grade book on that note and uh, take our eyes off the clouds and, and uh, hit the NFL. Let's talk about the NFL free agency, Dave. Monday was a day like no other for your New England Patriots. 
so-called legal tampering period began on Monday. So you're allowed to talk to players. You're not supposed to sign them until Wednesday, but the Patriots signings were coming thick and fast. Nevertheless, we, we were texting and I asked you how, you know, what you thought of the signings. And you said, oh, I thought that, you know, two good picks. I said, well, actually, I think there's three so far. And by the time I texted back the name of the third guy, there was four. And, and I think there were seven or so by the end of the day. Now, we, we could make this a really parochial show and, and grade all those picks. And there's probably been five or six more since. But we're going to do a little more objectively to avoid uh, too much grade inflation here. Uh, so Sporting News put together a list of the top 50 free agents. And so far, nobody in the top 10 has changed teams just yet. Five of them re-signed with their current team. Uh, three had a franchise tag applied, so presumably will be back with their current team, assuming they sign that, that franchise tag or they do sign an extension later on in the summer. And there's two that are still on the market. We're we'll at the contracts of the three highest rated players who actually switch teams, which actually allows us to begin with the Patriots because uh, coming in at number 11 on their list of the top free agents was Hunter Henry, uh, formerly, of course, of the Chargers, who signed with the Patriots for a three-year deal $37.5 million makes him the third highest paid tight end tied for third with another Patriot signing of Monday, Jonu Smith. So what would you grade the, the Hunter Henry signing, Dave? Well, I think what's important to remember here are not simply the individual contracts that players were signing with teams uh, when, or having discussions on Monday, but signing Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, but the contract that's signed between the NFL and the major television networks on Thursday. It's going to take that salary cap that was what, 180, 182 million or something like that for this year because of COVID and its effect on game revenues and all the rest. And it's probably going to jump that number somewhere in the 230 to $240 million range next year. You're going to see a 50 to $60 million jump in the salary cap. Why is that important? Well, if I were grading each of these things based upon the, the number 37.5 million over three years with a $180 million salary cap, I'd probably give this signing a C minus. But because there's going to be more money down the road, that 37.5 million, that 12.5 million a year doesn't look so bad. It looks like a B plus or an A minus uh, contract, which is why I know you don't want to make a parochial, but I think a lot of what uh, Bill Belichick and the Patriots did this week was based upon their knowledge, maybe perhaps inside knowledge from Robert Kraft, who's on the committee that makes the contract with uh, these uh, television networks, that things are going to change. So I don't see that as a bad deal. Henry's a, you know, Henry's a solid player, probably top two tier, uh, maybe second tier tight end. And uh, yeah, I mean, we've, we've had a lot of great uh, enjoyment watching Gronk play here. Henry's not Gronk, but B plus money uh, fits with need. Yeah. I think I give it a B, I, you know, third highest paid tight end seems a little bit high for Henry, but like you say, I think he's, he's in the mix near the top of that second tier. He's certainly no, not, not Kelsey. He's not Kittle. Uh, he's not Darren Waller, but after that, there's a pretty good group in that next tier. And I think, you know, with, with scheming, the Patriots can make perhaps um, great opportunities for him to be, better than he has been up until this point. So I think that's, that's a solid signing. All right. Second, the number 16 player on that sporting news list, JJ Watt. So having been released by Houston, signed with the Cardinals for two years, $28 million. Well, if you're a Houston Texans fan, I think you, I think you're porting over to the Arizona Cardinals because first it was DeAndre Hopkins and now it's, it's JJ Watt. What do you make of that signing? I'd also give this kind of a high grade, uh, probably at least to be, I, I would say. I mean, JJ Watt's not his defensive NFL player of the year that he was five or six years ago, where he just, you know, you were just so worried when you were playing them that he was just going to destroy you. But um, some people call him just like an inhuman presence on a team, and you kind of see him on the sideline. He's just kind of ecstatic. And, you know, that brings a certain level of leadership to the Cardinals that I, I, I think they as a young team need. So um, I think he'll rub off well uh, on that team and, and, and help them out. And they were kind of, I, I think they were an exciting young team. So yeah, I'm going to give that a B. 
Yeah, I agree with that. I think I think the leadership side, he's certainly still a player, a high caliber player, you know, a, maybe not quite Pro Bowl, but near Pro Bowl caliber. So two years, $28 million seems a very reasonable for that quality and those qualities for a team, like you say, that that's that's young and talented, but but needs some some of those veterans. All right, last signing we're gonna talk about. Number 19 on the sporting news list was Corey Davis, wide receiver, late of the Titans, now signed with the Jets for that same magic three years, $37.5 million. I hate to give the Jets an A minus for anything, but I, I'm going to give that signing. I hate to give the Jets anything, uh, but I'm going to give them an A minus. I just, I wanted the Patriots to sign Davis. He reminds me of, of a player who I just think is just amazing in that position, DK Metcalf who plays for the Seahawks, just big, fast, you know, can just do it all. Uh, Jets are going to have a new quarterback next year, I think, uh, someone that they draft. So you better have someone you can throw it to. So I'll, I'll give that an, an A-. minus. I don't, I don't think $12.5 million for a player who could be next level is, is that much. Yeah, that makes them the 19th highest paid receiver based on average value. So that's, you know, that's sort of a – a decent number one receiver, but nothing more than that. So I agree. I think that's a, that's a good signing. Uh, They're going to need some right receiver talent. You've got to take some of the pressure off a new young quarterback. So I would give that an a minus as well. All right. Well, we're going to wrap up the show with some more sports because as of maybe about an hour ago, the NCAA tournament is underway. The last 64 teams, of course, last night you had the, the first four to decide those last four spots. Um, last week we picked the number one seeds and we were both one for two. So you said Alabama and Michigan. I said, Illinois and Alabama. We got the big 10 teams, right. But Alabama just missed it appears. They were the number five team in the committee's uh, ordering. So, so they're a number two seed, but we got one of the two. So that makes you 14 and four. Now uh, I'm eight and 10. So what we're going to do is we're going to pick four of the matchups for tomorrow's game, Saturday's games. So out in the West, we've got what could be a, a grudge match between Oklahoma and Missouri. It's Missouri having abandoned the Big 12 after 100 years in the conference for the SEC a, f- a few years ago. Oklahoma is 15 and 10, Missouri 16 and 9. Oklahoma is the eight seed, Missouri is the nine, and Oklahoma is the two-point favorite. Who do you like in that game, Dave? I am going to go with Oklahoma. How about yourself? I agree. I'm going to take Oklahoma. We were, we were picking the eight, nine matchups last time. I think this is one of the eights that's going to go through. All right. Second game in the West. We've got Oregon against Virginia Commonwealth in the seven, 10 matchup. Oregon is 20 and six Virginia Commonwealth, which made a, an amazing deep run in the tournament a few years ago, 19 and seven. Uh, Oregon is the five point favorite. I'm going to go with Oregon here. Five points is a lot, but I, I still think I, I still think they get that. Yeah, they had a, they had a good season in the in the Pac-12 and came up just short in the title game against their cross-state rivals, Oregon State. But I think they get it back on track at least get through the first round here and and cover that five-point spread. In the East, we've got UCLA against BYU in the six eleven game. UCLA is coming off a big win last night, overtime win over Michigan State. 18 and nine underdog in this BYU 20 and six this year and 20 and three against any team not named Gonzaga. So they had a great year kind of flew under the radar a bit because Gonzaga was so much better than everybody else in in the WAC, but BYU is a three and a half point favorite in this one. What do you think? I think BYU sends them home. I think BYU was the only team really that came close to beating Gonzaga this year. So BYU takes this one. All right. I'm going to take the opposite side. I read a story about how some of these teams coming off the uh, play-in games have some momentum going forward, not so much the 16 seeds who have to go up against the number one seed buzzsaw, but but those 11 seeds that come in against the 6-11 games tend to do pretty well. So I think this might be one of those upsets. I'm going to take UCLA, especially with the three and a half points. I I feel pretty confident about that one. All right, lastly, our second game in the East, Colorado and Georgetown, the 5-12 game. I don't know what happened to Georgetown, but they had this amazing run through the Big East, capped off by a 25-point win over Creighton, who's the number five seed in the West, despite that. And Georgetown, of course, is the 12th seed here. Colorado, the five seed, makes sense. Colorado's 22-8 and eight on the year. 
Georgetown, even with that tournament run, only 13 and 12. Colorado, the five and a half point favorite. Can Georgetown keep it going? I think so. I think I know whatever Patrick Ewing said to them, but uh, yeah, I think uh, they're on a roll right now. And as you see, teams those last 10 games before tournament are often indicative of what they do in the first couple of rounds of the tournament. So yeah, I think even Georgetown may win this game, uh, but with five and a half points, I'm definitely going to take the Hoyas. I agree with you. Let's see them be a Cinderella story, make a, make a run to the Sweet 16 or, or beyond. It'd be fun. All right. Well, we got a lot of watching to do, a lot of brackets to keep an eye on. We'll update you on our brackets next week. We're part of a, a larger pool on that, but we'll, we'll certainly be talking about that as well. In the meantime, hope everyone has a good week. Look forward to being back with you next week. Don't forget to review the show and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. And you can reach us on Instagram at Democracy in America Today and contact us by email, democracyinamericatoday at gmail.com. Take care and talk to you soon.